Good morning. I'm Brian Taylor. I'm the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies here at UCLA and am co-teaching a course with Professor Michael Manville on the policy and planning implications of the rise of shared mobility. And today for our final speaker in uh, a lecture series we've had on these implications of shared mobility, we're shifting to automation. And our speaker today is Dr. Steve Schladover. He's one of the pioneers of the creation of the uh, topic of intelligence transportation systems in the US and he began his work with the founding of the California PATH program or Partners for Advanced Transit and Highways in the mid-1980s. Dr. Schladover holds bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in mechanical engineering at MIT, which I understand is in the east somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere in the east. Okay. Uh, where he also satisfied the course requirements for a doctorate in transportation systems. He began working on applications to information technology for improving surface uh, transportation as a graduate student, and has since then worked on a wide variety of research projects related to these topics. He combines hardcore engineering expertise with dynamic systems and control uh, with knowledge of transportation system policy, planning, economics, which enables him to effectively integrate these two to look at this uh, incredibly interesting and complex problems that are arising uh, with increasing automation. He was one of the first researchers to do in-depth investigations, uh, uh, probe vehicle data sampling in the days of vehicle infrastructure integration, where we were going to make the infrastructure smart as well, identifying limitations to uh, the, uh, the, the approach that had been taken at the time and recommending changes to it. Today he'll be wrapping up our quarter-long uh, series by looking into the future in a lecture entitled Opportunities and Challenges for Implementation of Automation in Road Transportation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Schladover to UCLA. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here to talk about one of my favorite topics and uh, opportunities and challenges. So I'll talk about the opportunities first and then get into the challenges, which are indeed fairly challenging. And if you got most of your information about this topic through the general interest media or through the internet, most of what you've read is wrong. And that's actually a problem because the public and our elected officials are being seriously misled about what uh, might be happening in coming years. So I'm going to talk first about the different levels of road vehicle automation. Often this is discussed as if it's a single thing, but in fact it's a wide range of possible concepts uh, that can do many different things. And then I'll talk about what types of impacts each of those types of automation could have on travel and some predictions about when those things might actually happen. Uh, those predictions are much more conservative than most of what you might have read online. Um, and then I'll talk about why that's so hard. What are the safety challenges and the technical challenges that make it difficult, that mean it's going to take longer than most people expect. And then some of the broader deployment challenges. We'll get into the policy issues as well that in many ways are quite subtle. And given all those challenges, then at the end I'll say, what should we be doing at this point? When we get into this subject, we have some serious terminology problems. This makes it really difficult for people to communicate on the topic because we talk right by each other. Somebody uses a word to mean one thing, somebody else interprets it to mean a different thing. We have a lot of common terms that are really misleading, vague, or flat out wrong. And first of those is driverless. We often read articles about driverless vehicles. Well, in the vast majority of the cases, they're not driverless. There's still a driver there. The role of the driver may have changed, but it's not driverless. Self-driving is another one of those vague and uh, hard, easy to misunderstand terms. And probably worst of all, autonomous. Uh, that word has four different meanings in common usage, and three of them are wrong. So whenever somebody uses that word autonomous, I don't know what they mean. I always have to ask more questions. What do you really mean when you say that word autonomous? So when we're talking about these types of systems, there are several key issues that we have to try to clarify. First is what's the role of the driver and what's the role of the system? And there are many different mixes of those. Second is what degree of connectedness and cooperation is involved? That is vehicles connecting and cooperating with each other and with the roadside infrastructure. And the last of those is something called the operational design domain of the system, which I'll explain in just a couple of minutes. 
But first of all, deal with this word autonomous. Um, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary. That's generally what we accept as the, uh, the best definitions in the English language. And I want to go down to the bottom here, automation, because I think most of what we're really talking about is automation. The use of electronic or mechanical devices to replace human labor. So if we have a system that's doing something that a human would otherwise do, that's automation. Autonomy simply relates to self-governance, independence, independence of decision-making. It has nothing to do with whether a machine is replacing a human. Within intelligent transportation systems, we could have cooperative systems or autonomous systems. So the cooperative ones are the ones that are connected with each other, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure. The autonomous ones are the unconnected ones. And then we can have automated driving systems, systems that are taking over part or all of the driving function that might be autonomous or cooperative. And I shifted that circle towards the cooperative side because I think it's pretty easy to show that they're almost going to have to be cooperative. Indeed, if they're not cooperative, they will probably make traffic conditions worse than they are today rather than better. The other important concept is the operational design domain. Um, this is defined in an SAE document that I'll refer to on a later slide that has a whole series of definitions related to automated driving. So the operational design domain is the specific conditions under which a given driving automation system is designed to function. And that can have many different dimensions. I just listed some examples here. It could be what type of roadway is it designed to operate on? What range of traffic conditions, traffic density, or speed is it able to operate under? Which geographic locations can it serve? Uh, what are the boundaries of the geographic location where that vehicle is able to operate? What are the limitations on weather and lighting conditions? Uh, does it need any supporting infrastructure, either markings on the road or special signs or special curbs or other ways of separating it from the rest of the traffic? And what condition of pavement markings and signage would be needed for the system to work? These systems are not superhuman. These are not systems that can do everything that people can do. They can do subsets of what people can do. And this operational design domain is a critical concept in understanding under which conditions is the system able to function and under which conditions is it not able to function. A few other important terms from the SAE document. The dynamic driving task. Driving is a very complicated function and includes many different types of activities. The dynamic driving task is defined to be the operational and tactical functions. So these are lower level functions to operate a vehicle in on-road traffic, but excluding the strategic functions like the trip planning and selection of destinations. So you could have a system that does those lower level dynamic driving tasks while the person is still deciding where they're going to go or either which route are they going to take to get there, while the system could do things like the steering and the speed control. A second important term of object and event detection and response. This is really important when we get to identifying the boundaries between what people do and what a system does, because this is a difficult task and or a set of tasks. So these are the subtasks of that dynamic driving task that include monitoring the driving environment, so detecting, recognizing, classifying objects, looking at all those things in the environment that may be hazards, and then responding to them in order to successfully complete the dynamic driving task. Uh, this is important because many of the systems that people have implemented are not capable of doing this task entirely. They depend on the human to do this task. Those are some of the intermediate levels of automation. The full set of definitions are available at this particular website. This is under the SAE, formerly known as the Society of Automotive Engineers. And unlike most of their documents, this one's available for free. You can download it directly. It's about a 30-page document, very small print, not easy to read, but it has some really clear and precise definitions of all the terms and of the levels of automation. So when we start thinking about the different aspects of driving that could be automated, here are some criteria that are defined within the SAE document for assigning them to different levels. So the first is does this system perform either longitudinal or lateral vehicle motion control? That is, does it do the steering or does it do the speed and spacing control between the vehicles? If it does one of those, but not the other, it's a level one automation system. 
And the second question is, does it do both of those, the steering and the speed and spacing control? If it does both of those, then it's at least a level two system. But then we get to that concept of the object and event detection and response. Is if it also does the object and event detection and response, then it's at least a level three system. And if it also does the fallback, that is responding to failures, if it can deal with all of the unanticipated things that might occur in the driving environment, then it's at least a level four system. And if it's limited to any particular operational design domain, it's level four, but it's not level five. It only gets to level five if it's unconstrained in operational design domain. That means the system can drive everywhere that people can drive under the full range of weather conditions and road and lighting conditions. That doesn't mean it has to be able to drive through a tornado because, or through four foot high snow drifts because people can't drive through four foot high snow drifts or in tornadoes, but it has to be able to do all the things that people can do. So there's a simple chart that identifies the different levels with this staggered line going through the middle showing the boundaries between what the system does and what the people do. But it's easier to look at it in terms of the types of systems. So level one systems would be, for example, an adaptive cruise control, which uses the radar to look to the distance to the vehicle in front and helps maintain a proper following distance, or something that does lane keeping, but the driver has to do the other driving function and to monitor the driving environment. Level two systems allow for doing both of those, the adaptive cruise control to control the speed and the separation and the steering control, but the driver still has to monitor the driving environment. The driver's still doing that complete object and event detection and response. This is what we have on the market right now with a number of high-end cars um, that have been getting quite a bit of attention. Uh, there are also some new systems that have just been introduced that allow a vehicle to park by itself. If the driver gets out of the car, the car will park, but the driver has to supervise it with uh, a key fob and hold a button down to make sure if the driver does not continue to hold the button down, the car stops because the driver is the one who has to make sure there's no child getting in the path of the vehicle or some object that the car is about to hit. Level three is now the first time when the system can take over that object and event detection and response but it can't handle the fallback. So the driver has to be available when needed to take over when the system runs into a situation it can't handle. Level four is now the first level where the driver might actually be able to go to sleep uh, because the system can handle all the driving activities and can do the fallback. It can ensure safety regardless of what happens within a particular operational design domain. And that's now, uh, also where we might have the first of the vehicles without drivers, like low-speed shuttle vehicles that could operate within a closed campus, or a system that might allow valet parking of a car within a garage, but it would have to be a garage from which pedestrians are excluded and other vehicle drivers are excluded. It's just for those specially equipped vehicles. So there's, and there are a variety of specialized level four systems. Level five, is where we get to the automated taxi that can go everywhere or the car share repositioning system that's going to be able to pick, take the car from wherever you left it to wherever the next person needs it. You don't really get to that until we get to level five. Uh, to show the relationship between the levels of automation and the operational design domain, this chart is actually quite useful because it shows the importance of that operational design domain. The blue things exist already today. So level zero, we already have safety warning systems or intermittent intervention systems on vehicles. Uh, Anti-lock brake systems or electronic stability control systems are on vehicles today and they'll work everywhere. So they're out of this corner of the chart. Lane departure warning systems are here, blind spot warning systems. So these don't change the driver's driving task or driving responsibility, but they provide assistance to the driver so that's still level zero automation. Level one automation uh, would be the adaptive cruise control or, for example, some of the parking assist systems that will do the steering, but the driver still has to control the speed. And those will operate in most places already. Um, level two systems uh, provide the adaptive cruise control plus the lane keeping, and those operate in 
some reasonable road environments. You can't use them in high density urban traffic. You can use them on highway environments or rural roads. There are no level three systems on the market right now, and later on I'll explain why level three is actually somewhat troublesome. There are real human factors concerns about whether it's possible to make a level three system safe. At level four, I always remind people we have airport people movers, and we've had them for 40 years. They operate on physically segregated facilities, and there's no driver on board. So they're operating without human intervention, and they have been for 40 years. What makes it hard is when you have to start expanding the operational design domain beyond those very limited environments. So we could get into things like the system might only operate on limited access highways in certain ways, or system that might operate at low speed within a confined urban area. Only when we get to that complete automation under all conditions do we get to level five automation. So what might these different types of automation do to our transportation system? So let's take a look at that. The automation is not an end in itself. It's intended to be a tool to help us solve some of our transportation problems. And then we need to look at what can it do to help us with some of those transportation problems. First of those is congestion. So if we have that automatic control of the vehicles, we can increase the capacity of the roadway infrastructure that we have. We can get the vehicles closer together and we can smooth out the traffic flow dynamics so they're less susceptible to stop and go disturbances and maintain a more constant speed. Um, we can also reduce energy use and emissions, partly by smoothing out the traffic flow dynamics, but also through aerodynamic drafting. When we get the vehicles closer together, they actually um, form a platoon and they can reduce drag. This is something we do with trucks in particular. And I listed safety last, uh, so we can reduce and mitigate crashes. I put it last because it's by far the most difficult, and I think that's the one where the expectations have been raised to the most unrealistic level. Uh, so maybe, but it's going to take quite a lot of work to get there, and I'll explain why. In order to get those benefits, though, the vehicles really do need to be connected with each other. If they're operating autonomously, they are not going to alleviate congestion. They're going to make congestion worse. They're going to make energy use and emissions worse because autonomous automated vehicles are more unstable drivers than humans are. And we've actually done experiments to show uh, how that's the case. So digging into the congestion, first of all, if we look at a highway lane in the U.S. operating under the best conditions, we can probably get about 2,200 vehicles per hour per lane. Uh, and that's limited by driver's ability to follow other vehicles and to maintain suitable gaps. But if you took an aerial photograph of a highway that's operating at that maximum capacity, 2,200 vehicles per hour per lane, you discover the vehicles are only occupying about 5% of the road surface. The other 95% of the road surface is all the spaces between the vehicles. So even a large passenger car, a sport utility vehicle is only half the width of a lane. And when they're operating at that maximum throughput, you've got about 10 car lengths between them on average. If you're out on the 405 and you're doing 10 miles per hour, you're not getting 2,200 vehicles per hour per lane. The density is a lot higher than this, but about higher than the 5%, but it isn't even up to 50%, maybe it's 30%, but at that point, your throughput is much less than 2,200 vehicles per hour per lane. Um, the shock waves that uh, produce the stop and go disturbances that we experience also result from the response delays of drivers. Drivers do not instantly perceive what's happening with the traffic up ahead. It takes time to respond, and that leads to delays in the dynamic response. Now, drivers do have the advantage that they can look multiple vehicles ahead, and they can see brake lights off in the distance, and know in advance they may need to slow down. That's something that the automated vehicles are not good at. That's one of the reasons the automated vehicles, without the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, are going to make shockwaves worse than they are today rather than better. So the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle cooperative automation helps us get the vehicles closer together, providing the shorter gaps, and they can respond more quickly to disturbances in the traffic up ahead. And the infrastructure-to-vehicle cooperation helps us maximize the capacity through highway bottlenecks by setting the most appropriate target speed. 
The most appropriate target speed for getting traffic through a bottleneck is not necessarily the highest speed they can drive. It might be somewhat less than that. And if the system can provide that speed guidance to the vehicles from the infrastructure, we can actually make an improvement in traffic as well. So energy and emissions, look at how can we contribute to that. When the vehicles are driving at highway speed, about half of the energy they consume is overcoming aerodynamic drag. And our research group and other research groups in Europe and in Asia have done similar experiments, have shown that if we can get them closer together, we can save in the range of 10 to 20 percent of the energy use just by reducing the drag. Uh, the other thing is the accelerate and the decelerate cycles that you get waste energy and also produce excess emissions. But by having the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, we can damp those out as well. Safety, and that's the hard one. Uh, we always hear these statistics, 90 to 95 percent of the crashes that we have in the U.S. are caused by some type of a driver behavior problem combined with some problems in the driving environment. So those may be driver perception or judgment problems. There may be inadequacies in the driver responses or drivers just not paying attention. So if we've got automation rather than a driver, those problems go away. And if we've chosen appropriate sensors and appropriate communication technologies that are not vulnerable to weather problems, then the problems that are based on weather can also go away. But we also have to consider what are the new problems that are going to in, be introduced by the automation, which I'll get to a little bit later. The critical thing is traffic today is incredibly safe. I, I hear so many speakers go out and say drivers are, people are terrible drivers. People are, do a really bad job of driving. They're very unsafe. No. When you look at the data and you consider how much exposure there is, the rate of crashes is astonishingly low. So just taking the U.S. traffic safety data, there's about 3.3 million vehicle hours between fatal crashes. So that's 375 years of nonstop 24-7 driving. And think what that means and compare it to things like your laptop computers or your mobile phones or our other modern electronic devices that have lots of embedded software. Can you imagine a laptop computer able to go 375 continuous years without ever giving you a little hourglass symbol with a spinning blue donut that says it's not ready to give you an answer to whatever question you asked. But that computer was driving your car, you crashed. Because it's got to be able to give you whatever information you need within about a tenth of a second. Even if we don't look at fatals, but we consider injury crashes, there's about 65,000 hours between injury crashes. That's over seven years of 24-7 nonstop driving. So when I talk about these higher levels of automation being further off in the future, this is the main reason. Because nobody, nobody knows how to design software of the robustness to be able to operate for those extended periods of time under the full range of traffic complexity without getting into a serious problem. So let's look at the different levels of automation and what they might do. So first, either no automation or just the basic driver assistance, level zeros and one. I think this is where we will see a significant safety improvement because at this level, we're adding the vigilance of the system, its sensors, its sensor signal processing to the driver's vigilance. So it's driver enhancements, safety warnings that can be based on the sensors that measure the distance and the speeds of the other vehicles around. And while the automation is focusing on one of those driving functions, the driver can give full attention to the other driving function. Some of this is also just comfort and convenience, like adaptive cruise control. Uh, I mean, I, I've been using it for five years. Everybody I know who has a car with adaptive cruise control says they'll never buy another car without it. It is such a great driving convenience. Um, whether we get benefits in the traffic congestion, the energy, and the environment is going to depend on having that vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure cooperation. But these technologies are already widely available. The market uptake has not been huge. Not that many people have chosen to get them as options, but they are widely available on many cars, both high-end cars and mid-range cars. 
Level two automation, that's where we've now got the steering control. Oh, question? Yeah. You mentioned before the blue screen donut with the yeah. computer not responding. Has that happened uh, in the, with the automated cars, the um, experimental ones? Oh, yeah, there are all sorts of things that they can't handle. Um, I mean, every one of those experimental cars has at least one supervisory driver who's there to take over when things go wrong, and some of them have two supervisory drivers. Um, you may have read the media stories a few months ago about Uber offering, quote, driverless taxi service in Pittsburgh. Those driverless taxis have two people sitting up in front, a dri safety driver and another engineer with a computer in front of them watching everything that's going on. So what they're doing is what Google's been doing for the last three years in Mountain View, California, which is driving the vehicles around, collecting lots of data. It's just that Uber is letting passengers ride along with them. So those drivers are there to intervene when anything looks even the slightest bit suspicious. And they do need to intervene quite a bit. Uh, the most interesting things to find out would be just how often do they need to intervene. And unfortunately, that information is not very widely available. Uh, but uh, I'd be really interested to uh, learn what that is. I mean, certainly Google has put out enough information to show that they're getting better, but how good they actually are right now is still kind of hard to tell. Um, so for the level two systems, now we've got both the steering and the speed control being done automatically, but the driver still is doing all of the objects and event detection and response, has to look out for any problems in the driving environment. Well, we may get a safety increase, but that's going to depend on how effectively the drivers continue to pay attention to what's going on around the vehicle if the vehicle is doing the steering control and the speed control. And that's a problem. Uh, these are widely available, and this includes the, the Tesla as well as Infiniti, Volvo, or Mercedes. Um, unfortunately, people sometimes misuse these systems. These are uh, YouTube videos. The Mercedes system has a sensor in the steering wheel to detect that the driver's hands are on the wheel, because they expect the driver to keep the hands on the wheel. But, well, this guy just takes the soda can to the wheel to trick the torque sensor into thinking his hands were on the wheel, so he could take his hands off the wheel and do whatever he wants. So, as a safety, oops, sorry about the video, safety protection the manufacturer built in that the user defeated. Um, well, that's not so bad compared to what happened in this other one. This is the Infiniti Q50. Um, this is a case where a user went out on the highway. It doesn't have the torque sensor in the steering wheel, so it doesn't need the hands on the wheel. But this idiot got out of the driver's seat and went into the back seat of the car while it's hurtling down the public highway. And here, here you can see no, nobody in the driver's seat. Uh, and then he even shows a video, oh, yeah, sorry, the video is getting pixelated like that. Uh, there's a section there where he actually shows himself getting out of the driver's seat to go into the back seat. Now this is unbelievably stupid because if anything had gone wrong while he was doing this, it's guaranteed crash and pretty serious crash. Um, yeah, just be careful not to hit the steering wheel. Uh, uh, sorry, quality of the video is not what it should have been. But this is a case in which something that, at least in theory, should be making driving safer could actually be making it a lot less safe because people misuse it. And there's a lot of work going on in the industry right now to figure out how do you prevent people from doing stupid stuff like that. And the most common solution that I've seen, and I think it's probably going to become pretty standard, is a little video camera mounted right above the steering wheel that's looking at the driver's face. And if it detects the driver's eyes are not forward and at about the right height to be looking at the road, it will turn the system off. Uh, and I saw a nice demo of that by one of the car manufacturers about a year ago, which the test driver pulled out a mobile phone and looked down at the phone. And as soon as he took his eyes off the road to look down at the phone, the system started beeping and it started slowing the car down. So manufacturers have to put things in like that to prevent people from misusing the technology. So we get to the level three, conditional automation. Uh, now this is when the driver can tune out, at least for part of the time, but has to be able to resume control when the system runs into a problem. 
So the driver could actually do something else, like read a book, or get on the tablet, surf the web, whatever. But it's limited by that necessity to be able to retake control within a short period of time, undefined, but on the order of a few seconds when the system gets in trouble. A lot of manufacturers have said they don't think it's possible to make this safe because if you've not given the driver any tasks to do and just let them do whatever else they're going to do, how do you regain their attention when you really need their attention in an emergency condition? And I think time will tell whether we really see any of these come to market. Uh, it's still a somewhat controversial topic. And we may have government agencies stepping in and saying, no, you can't do that. Now, level four is where things get more interesting. And I've divided this into two categories, one for general purpose light duty vehicles like personal passenger cars, another for other categories of vehicles. Uh, these will probably only be usable in some places. And think of the simplest environments, like a limited access freeway. You don't have cross traffic. You don't have pedestrians. You don't have people pulling out of driveways and other things like that. So the environment is, is simpler. Uh, there should be a big gain in driving comfort and convenience on this. This is a case in which the driver could actually go to sleep on a long distance intercity trip because to get to level four, the system has to be able to ensure safety regardless of what malfunction might occur. Uh, and so we should actually have a safety improvement. We could get some significant increases in energy efficiency and traffic throughput if we've got systems using vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle cooperation. Every major vehicle manufacturer in the world is working their butts off trying to get this type of system ready to go on the market because I think they can visualize tremendous demand among the public for systems with this level of capability. Um, when might it happen? I'm guessing sometime in the 2020 to 2025 time frame we might see the first systems becoming available. Now when we get to special applications other than light duty passenger cars there are a lot more interesting near-term possibilities. So we could have buses operating on their own transit ways. Um, think of use of automatic steering control to allow the bus to operate within a very narrow right-of-way. You don't need a full-width busway. You just need one that's a little bit wider than the bus itself. You can offer a rail-like quality of service with a much less expensive vehicle and less expensive infrastructure than you'd need for rail. Uh, another really interesting one is heavy trucks on dedicated truck lanes. Uh, if you can operate those in close coupled platoons, you save energy and emissions. If you can segregate the trucks from the rest of the vehicles, you can make the environment simpler and safer, eliminate problems with cut-ins of uh, drivers who don't know what they're doing, and you can get higher capacity for a truck lane, and maybe with some really hard work on making it robust enough, you might even be able to get the drivers out of the following trucks in the platoon. Another one, the automated driverless valet parking uh, makes it possible to get into a more compact parking garage. If you can park the cars right next to each other, if you don't need space for opening the doors for people to get in and out of the cars. Uh, driverless shuttles within closed campuses is a really um, promising topic area. If you can provide first mile, last mile access to transit, let's say coming to a university campus like this, or coming to an industrial campus, or a medical center, or a retirement community, or other locations where there's a way of segregating them from the rest of the traffic, now you've got some opportunities to affect urban design. If you've got your urban design adjusted to account for use of these low-speed vehicles for providing the first mile, last mile access. Some of these might only be a few years away. Um, there's been quite a bit of work on that, more in Europe than in the U.S. These are pictures I took in La Rochelle, France. This is during a demonstration of a European project called City Mobile. And you see a small vehicle here that's driving under automatic control, only a little bit faster than walking speed. But it needs infrastructure modification. So here they set up a special traffic signal using a tram-like signal system. It communicates with the vehicle, so when the vehicle approaches, it requests the through signal for it, and it gives the red light to the crossing traffic. They also had to put up special signs to warn people about the vehicles. Um, here they're informing them about the flashing lights because it was kind of an unconventional way of, um, 
of managing the traffic. They had to eliminate parking along the route of the vehicle. There were special curbs that had to be installed so that bicyclists couldn't scoot right across the path of the vehicle because if a bicyclist came across the path of the vehicle, the sensors on the vehicle are not good enough to be able to detect the bicyclist in time. So here we've got a video that I also took while I was there. You can see the speed of the vehicle. See, it's only a little bit faster than walking speed. Um, and it's adjacent to the traffic lane. There is an attendant on board, uh, and that person does need to intervene periodically. It's, now you see the flashing red lights where it's going to cross the road. So the car has to stop to allow the, the automated vehicle to get through. And then you see it will be mixing with the pedestrians in, in the pedestrian zone there. Um, the technology is really not that robust yet. Those vehicles made lots of false alarm stops. There's nothing there on the road, but it's got a very cautious uh, threat detection system so that if maybe it's a reflection off something and this vehicle suddenly grinds to a halt. Uh, so the technology still has a way to go, but this is an example of something that could be built upon. Um, so what about the potential for shared use vehicles at level four? Um, well, these low speed shuttles are intended as shared use vehicles for first mile, last mile access to line hole transit or for circulation within an activity center. And I think those will be coming in specialized niche applications. But if we try to get to the so-called driverless taxi or the car share repositioning services, now I think there are going to be a lot of serious constraints on the operational design domain that will limit how broadly this can be used. So for the foreseeable future, I think it will only be within strictly geofenced locations that have been really carefully mapped and maybe even physically protected from hazards uh, within very limited speed range. Uh, probably only in fair weather, not in foul weather. And every manufacturer who's been working on vehicles of this class has very close supervision by a dispatch center. Those vehicles are not driving around unsupervised. Uh, there's somebody in the dispatch center who's overseeing them quite closely in order to make sure they don't get in trouble. And, um, as some of the part of some of the work we were doing for the California Department of Motor Vehicles to help them in the development of the state regulations for automation, I was actually really surprised at how strong an emphasis major companies that are working in this domain placed on the dispatch center. They said they don't like to talk about it publicly, so they don't reveal any of the technical details, but it's critically important to their operations. Level five, that's the one that gets all the media attention and that everybody gets really excited about. So this would be that taxi that can take you or take your minor child anywhere they wanted to go uh, or take your impaired adult wherever they want to go, whenever they want to go. Or the repositioning of the shared vehicle fleet wherever it needs to be repositioned. Or the urban goods delivery and pickup without any driver on board. Um, so that's sort of the ultimate in comfort and convenience, and it's also what leads to travel time disutility plunging to close to zero because what does it matter? You can do whatever you want while the vehicle takes you wherever you want to go. Uh, I think that's going to take many decades. This is not going to be in the foreseeable future uh, because there's some huge technical challenges to get to that ubiquitous operation without a driver. Um, <clears throat> When I uh, tell students in Berkeley about this, they usually get really disappointed. And I say, no, no, look on the bright side. You could spend your entire career working on this, and you won't run out of problems to solve. You'll have lots of interesting to, things to work on until you're ready to retire, and maybe until your children are ready to retire also. So how long might it take to get to some of these things? I'm going to say these are my personal estimates of market introduction and I'll explain why that's important on the next slides. And this is based on technological feasibility. If we have institutional and political challenges, those might add to the times. But, um, so the green things exist already. Here we go from level one through level five, and we look at different types of environments, fully segregated guideways, because we've already got level four. We've had it for 40 years. Limited access highways, we've got level one and two. 
the campus or pedestrian zones and the, some urban streets, we've got level one. But then I'm saying in the early 2020s, we're going to probably fill in those yellow parts, the 2025 range, the brown, uh, 2030s maybe to get to some of these darker browns, but to get to the level five going everywhere, say more like 2075. Um, maybe it's 2065, but maybe it's 2100 also. 2075 is far enough out there. There's a big uncertainty on that. Market introduction. This does not mean widespread use. And the reason is you have to consider how long it takes for things to work into the market. So <clears throat> these are the uh, data for adoption of seatbelts after seatbelts were required to be put on every new vehicle. So first of all, it took about five years to get to 90% of the new vehicles being equipped with seatbelts. And because you've still got lots of vehicles in the fleet that predated the arrival of the regulation, it was actually 11 years until 90% of the vehicles on the road were equipped with seatbelts. And the green plot here is the actual occupant use of seatbelts. So the difference here is because you have people had seatbelts in the vehicles, but they didn't buckle them up. So getting people to actually adopt them and use them took even more time. Now, in a way, this is the best case. If after a certain date, everybody's got to have it on their new vehicles, as the fleet turns over, it works through the fleet. But if we look at things that are not mandatory but are optional, it takes a whole lot longer. And these are historical data for things like automatic transmission, power steering, air conditioning, disc brakes, radial tires, and electronic ignition. And you can't see the dates in the back. This goes from 1950 to 1985. It's 35 years across that plot. So even on things that add a lot of value, you know, think of automatic transmission, air conditioning, it still took multiple decades from when those were introduced until when they became a really significant fraction of the vehicles on the road. So regardless of when these different automation features become available, by the time they become a large fraction of the vehicles on the road, it's going to be additional decades. So what are some of these challenges? Well, uh, we already talked about the fact that it's really safe today, but now we have to account what are the new crashes that are going to be caused by something going wrong with the automation. Not the crashes that are caused by drivers, crashes caused by the automation. Uh, when you're out there on the road for millions of miles, it's inevitable that the vehicle is going to encounter conditions that the system designer could not anticipate. What's it going to do? Is it really going to handle all of those new and unanticipated conditions perfectly, or in some cases, is it not going to handle them well? There will be software bugs that could not be exercised in testing because it is impossible to test every possible software path in software of this complexity. There could be faults within the vehicle that were not diagnosed. Uh, it could lead to failures. You could loss, have uh, really large failures within the vehicle, like loss of electrical power. If, the dri if there's no driver in the vehicle, or if the driver is sound asleep in the back of the vehicle, the driver can't act as a fallback. Safety depends entirely on the system. Um, there is no technology available to verify and validate the safety of software under the full range of operating conditions. This is an area where fundamental research is going to be needed. Uh, the vehicles have lots of electromechanical components that do not follow Moore's law, so they don't continually get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. In things like aircraft systems, you use redundancy, multiple instances of those sensors or those devices, so that if one fails, you still have a backup. You can't afford to do that with hardware on vehicles because the vehicles would become unaffordable. The driving environment is quite harsh and unpredictable. And if we're talking about private personal vehicles, we've got non-professional owners and operators who can't ensure that you've got proper maintenance or proper training of the operators. That's one of the reasons that some of the transit bus and trucking applications may very well come to fruition earlier than the private personal vehicle because you do have professional maintenance and professional training of the drivers. Some of the, the technical challenges the first ones are solvable with a lot of hard work. They don't require fundamental breakthroughs, but fundamental breakthroughs are needed to deal with system design errors, system specification errors, and software coding bugs. 
the technology does not exist to make those systems as robust as drivers are today. So there are going to be some needs for breakthroughs in software safety engineering uh, because the existing methods simply won't work for a system of this type. We're going to need some really good sensing and sensor signal processing. To get zero false negatives means you don't have any dangerous conditions that the system fails to notice. But you also need near zero false positives. Those are the cases where the system thinks there's a problem and there isn't. If your vehicle suddenly slammed on the brakes when there's no problem around, or suddenly swerves out of the lane when there's no threat in the lane, you're going to be really unhappy with it. And I don't know whether you'd even tolerate that happening once per year, but to get to a system that's not going to miss any of the really dangerous ones, and is also not going to give these false positive responses when there isn't a threat, is really difficult. And whatever the system does in identifying problems, it has to do it within about a tenth of a second. Because if it takes longer than that, you've got too high a risk of a crash. There's another whole set of issues involving ethical decision making for robotics that's finally starting to get some attention. What goes into the development of this system, which is now making life or death decisions for people inside the vehicle and for the other people that it's sharing the road with? How do you do that in an ethical way? And cybersecurity is now finally getting the attention it deserves as well. How do you protect it from attacks by the bad guys who might want to cause a vehicle to crash? This is much harder than automating commercial aircraft autopilots. Uh, in terms of how many targets your vehicle needs to keep track of, uh, how accurately it needs to know the distance to those other targets, and how accurately it needs to know the difference in speed between your vehicle and the other vehicles. These are orders of magnitude different. Time available to respond to an emergency. If you're in an aircraft at 30,000 feet, you've probably got tens of seconds to respond before you've got a critical situation. If you're on the road, you've maybe got a tenth of a second to respond. And you can't afford to put a multi-million dollar flight control system on a personal vehicle. So many ways, many dimensions in which this is a whole lot harder than what's been done with aircraft. And to focus on what are some of these broader deployment challenges, though, I think these may be interesting, particularly for people in planning and policy areas. We've got fundamental change in the nature of the driving task from what it has been historically. How are people going to adapt to that? We have extremely diverse driving population, ranging from novices to experienced, from uh, aggressive, inexperienced teenagers to maybe timid seniors. And any individual driver is different depending on the day of the week, at the time of the day. Did they just have a stressful day at work? Or are they relaxed? Are they fatigued? That they don't behave the same way. It's not clear how we train the drivers to acquire the proper mental model about what the system in their vehicle can do and what it cannot do. Um, there's a lot of evidence drivers are going to push the envelope to try to use the systems in ways they're not supposed to be used, and we already saw some videos of that. And there are no viable experimental protocols by which we can safely test how drivers are going to use those higher levels of automation can do a certain amount of that testing on test tracks, but once you go out on the public road in the full complexity of traffic, it's not at all clear how you're going to test how drivers use the systems. We have a public and private sector challenge as well. Um, we're accustomed to having publicly owned road infrastructure, privately owned vehicles. Well, now these vehicles in this infrastructure are trying to function as a system, which they don't do today. How do we provide that integrated system where part of it's public and part of it is private in order to achieve the societal benefits that may not be consistent with the individual driver benefits? Um, we have a particular challenge with difference in investment planning horizons. People who work on roadway infrastructure are dealing with systems that have lifetimes measured in decades. Vehicles have lifetimes measured in years information technology has lifetimes measured in months. Now they all have to be designed to work together and they have to go through life cycle together. How do we deal with that information technology that's cycling through many, many generations within each generation of vehicles, which are cycling through many generations within each um, life cycle of roadway infrastructure? 
those different sectors are bound to have conflicting priorities because of these differences in the investment planning horizons. And we don't have a good history of working together. There's a lot of mutual suspicion and mistrust between the sectors. How do we overcome that so that they can actually work together effectively to produce this well-integrated system? We don't have any business models at this point for funding the infrastructure that's going to be needed to support the automated vehicles. At this point, it's not clear how much infrastructure is going to be needed, but some infrastructure is almost bound to be needed in order for this to operate as a well-integrated system. How do we pay for it? Uh, what public policy actions are going to be needed to facilitate the implementation of the automation, assuming we've got the agreement that indeed on net it's going to be beneficial rather than detrimental? How do we harmonize the goals and the regulations among our different levels of government, federal and state, and among states? We already have different states taking different approaches to automation in terms of how risk averse do you want to be on regulations? What lessons can we learn from other transportation technology rollouts where we've got vehicles and infrastructure under different ownership? And I think of air traffic control and the next gen air traffic control system is a good example where there's a lot of tension between public and private sector. Um, we're dealing in an environment where the voters, the journalists, and the politicians are generally technological illiterates, which makes it really hard to sort out what's real from what's phony. And there's an awful lot of phoniness out there. How are they going to make wise decisions when they're being bombarded with information that's not correct? Uh, virtually all of the rules associated with motor vehicle usage right now are founded on an assumption that a driver is controlling the motion of the vehicle. Well, that's going to be different. So many of the assumptions underlying existing rules that govern motor vehicle operation won't be applicable in this more automated domain. and That's one of the recommendations that has come up is that that be studied more closely. Um, we've done a lot of work um, in Berkeley helping the California DMV with their regulations for the state of California and that's helped us to recognize some fundamental challenges that we encounter when we're trying to define regulations. How do we balance the need to protect the public safety from unsafe systems while still encouraging technological innovations that could in the long term make things safer. But the first instantiations of those may not be so safe. Um, we have historically a federal responsibility for regulating what is contained inside the vehicle and state regulations for covering how the vehicles are operated. That boundary is now blurred because the operation of the vehicles is governed by software that's embedded inside the computers that are in the vehicles. And just within the last couple of months, NHTSA within the federal DOT has put out a statement that's trying to start clarifying what's that boundary between the federal and the state responsibilities. We don't have any technical standards that can be referenced as the baseline for the performance of the systems for the safety of the systems or for the testing protocols. Yet a couple of people have already died because they misjudged that, because they let a vehicle do the driving when they should have been supervising it and they didn't supervise it. How do we detect the unsafe systems early enough that they're not going to kill or injure too many people? Um, we're doing this in an environment where we have both the automotive industry and the information technology industry coming together. Those industries have radically different cultures. The automotive industry is very cautious, very safety conscious. That's embedded within everything they do. The IT industry is not. Um, I live in Silicon Valley, so I see this all the time. The emphasis on getting it out on the market as quickly as possible. Even if the first implementation of that mobile phone app is rotten, but the concept is good, let the customers do the beta testing, and it'll improve and the product will succeed. You can't do that with safety-critical technology that's embedded in the vehicle. 
you can't have the customers do the beta testing because they're going to die in the process. And we have a challenge on self-certification versus third-party certification. Who's the authority that actually says whether this system meets the standards that it should meet? Um, so as I mentioned, NHTSA released some policy guidance just in September 20th of this year. Uh, I highly recommend this report. It's a 112-page report with 123 footnotes. So again, it's not easy reading, but it's really well thought out document that tries to find the right balance in terms of how government should be handling this new technology. Um, they have four major areas that they've addressed. Vehicle performance, they've suggested some model guidelines for state policies, and they've discussed both the current and future regulatory tools that they would use at the federal level to govern this. Uh, this applies to SAE level three and above vehicles. And now NHTSA is in the process of doing outreach to the industry and to the public to try to get more feedback uh, on this topic. So the, the critical technical element is something they call the safety assessment letter. So NHTSA is recommending that every vehicle manufacturer document 15 points that are listed here. And we don't have time to go through them all, but they're basically different aspects of the design and the development of the system that affect its safety. So they're telling the industry, you need to tell us how you're handling each of these points. Not what your design is, but it's more like what your process is for handling all of these things to make sure that they've thought them through carefully enough. Um, they've suggested a model state policy that was developed in coordination with ANVA, which is the association of all of the state uh, motor vehicle departments. Uh, they've now tried to clarify the boundaries between federal and state roles in regulating vehicle automation, and they've made a variety of suggestions for what states should do, including, for example, if you're going to test your automated vehicle, get approval from the local jurisdiction in the location where you're going to do the testing. Make sure the local government agency is okay with your using their streets and that you've consulted with the law enforcement people in that local jurisdiction. They're suggesting some minimum rules for testing and the qualifications of the test drivers, <coughs> how the um, highly automated vehicle should be noted on the registration, a variety of such topics. And they're also planning cross-border engagement with Canada and Mexico, so that it's not just a U.S., but it's a really a North American approach to how uh, the automated vehicles would be regulated. They recognize the need for enough consistency across states that vehicles won't be impeded from being sold in multiple states. But there's still some really big unresolved questions here. And um, this is among the reasons why you're not going to run out of things to work on for many years. First one, how safe is safe enough? Uh, even if we talked about that baseline for what it is today, well, how much safer does it need to be if it's being driven by an automated system? Um, What's the process you go through to determine how safe is safe enough? Well, even after you've determined how safe you want it to be, how do you determine whether any specific vehicle has met that safety target? What's the combination of analysis and testing on the test track and in traffic and simulation and any other number of methods that you apply to determine, yes, indeed, that vehicle has reached a certain safety level? Nobody knows how to do that. Um, what role should the different levels of government play in determining whether that specific vehicle is safe enough to be used on the public road? Um, California might decide it needs to be up to this level, but Texas might decide it's okay if it's down at that level. Well, now, what happens? Um, should the system be required to inhibit the abuse and misuse by the drivers? Uh, things like I showed in the, in the video. Should, I mean, manufacturers probably want to, but should they be required by law to inhibit those misuses. And how long is it going to take to get to those fundamental breakthroughs needed to get to the higher levels of automation? Uh, how much support and cooperation do the automated vehicles need from the infrastructure and from other vehicles? There are lots of different design concepts that could be applied with different levels of uh, uh, cooperation. Um, what should the public sector role be in providing infrastructure support? If you need some modifications to the infrastructure for those automated vehicles to be able to operate safely and efficiently, is that entirely a public sector responsibility, or is there some mix of public and private that should be involved in that? Because the vehicle manufacturers are benefiting if their systems can be 
designed to be safer and maybe more cost effective with some cooperative infrastructure. Are some new public-private business models needed to get to those higher levels of automation to allow for that vehicle and infrastructure integration? What's it going to do to public transport services and to what extent will societal goals for mobility be enhanced or degraded? Uh, some people say this is going to greatly enhance public transport by helping with the first mile, last mile problem. Other people say, well, if you make it so easy for people to use private vehicles, it's going to really undermine the role of public transport. And with all of those uncertainties, what's the net impact going to be on vehicle miles traveled, energy, and the environment? Uh, Department of Energy sponsored a first scan on that uh, a couple of years ago, and they came up with this ridiculous range from minus 90% to plus 200%. Well, that says we don't know anything. If we've got a range from minus 90 to plus 200. Um, one of the uh, things that's being done to try to make some progress on this is a couple of NCHRP projects. There's a research roadmap. Uh, I was a co-author of that. It's a very small project to identify what are the things that state and local governments should be doing to get prepared for both connected and automated vehicles. And then some of the projects that are identified in that roadmap are being funded through a new NCHRP project and through other DOT mechanisms. Uh, we don't have time to go through them all in detail, but there's uh, a set of institutional and policy issues. The ones with numbers actually have research projects that have been uh, initiated already. So there's, out of these, the only one that's been initiated is the implications for motor vehicle codes. Uh, another set on design and operations issues. A few of the, the, these have been started, one on cybersecurity, one on dedicated lanes for connected and automated vehicles. But there's still a bunch of other topics to be pursued. Uh, transportation planning. Um, there's one uh, just starting up on um, automated vehicles and regional long-term planning models, kind of our concept study. And then there's obviously more work on developing, assessing the impacts, and then modeling the long-term impacts that connected and automated vehicles could have. And uh, modal applications, there are a couple of projects on transit and long-haul freight and the implications of automation for those applications. So given all that, what do we do now? You know, confronted with all of these challenges, make a few suggestions here. Let's focus first on the connected vehicle capabilities so that we have the technology to enable vehicles to communicate and cooperate with each other and with the infrastructure. There's been a process going on for about the last 15 years to try to develop something called dedicated short-range communications. So it's a communication tech, wireless communication technology to enable this. Unfortunately, it's in jeopardy right now because some of the internet interests are trying to grab the spectrum to set aside to do that. Um, I'd say in order to get the, the earliest benefits from the highest levels of automation, let's concentrate on those transit and trucking applications, particularly when they can be done in protected rights of way with some separation from the rest of the traffic. We've got professional drivers and maintenance and the users, the owners and operators of those vehicles can get a direct economic benefit so they can justify the cost of a system before it comes down to a consumer level cost. We should see how we can capitalize on managed lanes to concentrate the equipped vehicles together. We already got lanes that are segregated from the rest of the traffic for purposes of HOVs or for a toll lane. Let's see if we can get the connected and automated vehicles concentrated in those lanes so that there's a higher percentage of them uh, coexisting with each other. And then lots of fundamental research on the enabling technologies to get to level five. So it's going to be decades of fundamental research and a lot of engineering disciplines in order to build the technological foundation that we can get to those higher levels of automation. And with that, I open it up for questions. Well, let me talk about how safe is safe enough. I've heard a lot of people talk about, oh, it's got to be five times as safe or ten times as safe, just kind of pulling numbers out of the air um, without necessarily thinking about what does that mean. 
Um, what would it take to get to that? So I don't think there's any consensus at this point. Uh, I've never heard anybody say it would be acceptable for it to be less safe than today because that question has come up as well. And we always start with at least equally safe to today, but then how much above what it is today, I think is still an open question. And it may be different in different countries, maybe different in, even in different parts of the US. Uh, people may have different attitudes towards it. Um, when we do work with California DMV, the question always comes up, how can we show that we've done our due diligence to protect the public against a vehicle that has not been properly engineered? because you don't want to have the case where a vehicle has killed a child and now the public says, what did you do to prevent that from happening? Have you done your due diligence? On the other hand, the state of Texas decided they didn't want to pass any regulations because they wanted to become uh, a hotbed for development of the new technology. So I asked somebody from Texas last year, what are you going to do the first time one of those vehicles kills a child out on the road? And the answer was, well, we'll think about that when the time comes. So, again, yeah, uh, different attitudes in different places. I'm sorry, now I forgot your first question while I was asking. <laughs> no, second question. Yeah. Like, how safe is safe enough that specifically towards transit? Oh, towards transit. Well, I mean, transit is always assumed to have a higher level of safety than private driving, and, and it does maintain that safety record. Uh, with the transit applications, the bigger safety issue is probably going to be the safety of the pedestrians who are coexisting with the vehicles, not necessarily the people inside the vehicles, but the other road users that it's got to share the space with. And how can the vehicle be engineered to be safe enough that it's not going to hit the pedestrians or the bicyclists, but also be able to maintain a viable commercial speed? I showed you that vehicle in San Ro San La Rochelle in the video, and it's running at a very low speed. It was a very low speed because the sensor range is really limited and if uh, they had a larger sensor range and more intelligent sensor signal processing, they might have been able to detect threats further away and go faster. But that's the state of the technology at the time the vehicle was developed. Um, yeah? Why do you think there's so much misinformation or perhaps false optimism about the deployment of the systems Yeah, they, I guess, get to level five? Yeah, yeah, that, that's. Can you repeat the question. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Okay, that's right. Oh, why is there so much uh, over optimism um, and uh, false information about the timeline to get to these higher levels of automation? Um, there's a set of perverse incentives at work. Everybody in the vehicle industry wants to put forward the image that they're the leader. They're more advanced than everybody else. So it gets into a little bit of a contest about who can make the grander claim about what they're going to be doing. Now. What they do is they use the language in misleading ways. I talked about misleading terminology early in my talk, and um, some of the people in the industry have been, become very skilled at using those words to mislead people. So they'll say, uh, I can think of a CEO of one major company who says, uh, we're going to have an autonomous vehicle in 2020. Well, what does that mean? Um, and what it means is they'll have a vehicle that has some level of automation that can operate under some set of limited conditions in 2020. But he uses the word autonomous, which to many people connotes totally automated, no driver involvement. That's not what it means at all. And I actually wrote about that in an article published in Scientific American back in June called The Truth About Self-Driving Cars. Uh, it was translated into some other languages, other publications related to Scientific American. And I got a message from the head of the automation development work in the company whose CEO has made those grand claims. And he loved the article. He, <laughs> he agreed with everything that I was saying, which is what I'm just telling you here. But so what we will see is some systems that operate under some very constrained environments with some very limited amounts of automation, but the incentives are for the manufacturers to make it appear like it's much more than it really is. And yes? Back on the safety issue, it seems like we're putting um, a lot of hope into the technology to provide the safety benefits. Um, but like you were talking about earlier with the, the camera idea to focus on the driver, um, are there other things we can do to kind of put the onus back on the driver until we get to the, the level five? 
Well, there are a lot of people look at this is uh, what can we do to put the onus on the driver so that the, the driver doesn't disengage and we still have the driver involved. And there are a lot of people in the industry looking at that right right now. Um, indeed, uh, General Motors purchased a company that does eye tracking a couple of years ago, and I'm pretty sure that's because that's the way they're going to make sure that the drivers of their system have their eyes looking forward. That's sort of a simple example. It can show where the driver is looking. It can't necessarily tell if the driver's brain is engaged because the driver could be eyes could be facing forward, but the driver could be daydreaming and you know about something else. And there's also a problem with sunglasses. It turns out any of those things that are looking at the driver's face, if the driver's wearing sunglasses, they can't see where the eyes are. So those all have limitations. Some people are looking at biometric methods, modeling, um, predicting what the driver's state is. But uh, it's still an area of active research. So I don't think there's a, a, a you know crystal clear answer yet on that. Uh, yes, you. Regulatory agencies can do to ensure that safety, uh, we have historic levels of driver yeah. safety. Um, oh. So, how do you see those two things uh, progressing together? Okay, so let me make sure I understand. You're concerned about the potential decrease in safety of the other road users who need to coexist with the automated vehicles, and how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Just in general, at the stopgap until we get to the left. Well, yes, so there is some evidence right now that safety is decreasing because people are paying too much attention to their phones rather than to their driving. And the best thing we can do is actually a lot of the warning and control assistance systems that are coming on the market right now. For example, you've got a radar system looking forward from your vehicle detecting objects in the path of the vehicle. If you're going too fast uh, and it appears like you're going to be have a potential of colliding with that object, it'll give you a warning so that that should re-engage your attention so that you should not get into that problem. Or if you're drifting out of the lane, the lane departure warning system that recognizes the position of the vehicle relative to the lane markings will give a warning or in some cases may actually steer the vehicle to try to keep it within the lane so it doesn't depart from the lane. So those are all technologies that have been under development for a while and they're coming on the market. I think they will help enhance driver safety. Um, the place where things get awkward is when the automation takes over just enough of the driving that the driver isn't paying attention anymore. And now the driver becomes overly dependent on the technology. And that's the thing that people are wrestling with right now. How do we make sure the drivers don't become overly dependent on technology so the technology has to handle everything rather than having the technology and the driver uh, working in concert with each other. So uh, and I think that's going to be one of the key things. How do you get the technology and the driver mutually supportive in trying to ensure safety? Yes? Um, so at this point in time, how concerned do you think we should be with the potential of ABs to work against? I, I didn't hear the end of the question. Potential to work against? Oh, uh, how concerned should we be about them working against public transportation? I think the main thing is to try to encourage the public transportation applications of the automated vehicles. So how can we apply the technology to help make bus transit systems work more effectively? Uh, how can we use that to uh, encourage first mile, last mile access to line haul transit systems in areas that are, uh, that are not well served with first mile, last mile access? So uh, that's and I think those could be early winners in the use of the technology, particularly when we think about uh, technologies that involve some cooperation with the infrastructure. Because if you've got a transit service operating on a fixed route, you only need to put the infrastructure technology along the route of that vehicle. You don't need to put it on every street in the network. So I think there are a lot of opportunities to use the technology to actually make the transit work better. But there has to be a commitment to do it. Uh, Yes, in the back. So I'd like to follow a question. So is that where the relationship or the opportunity between private autonomous vehicles and TNCs comes in to try to enhance that 
I uh, okay. The question about the relationship between TNCs and uh, and the automation and yeah, well, and I don't think of this so much in terms of TNCs as I do in terms of transportation services, regardless of who's operating the services. I mean, a TNC just happens to be a particular form of uh, service provider. But uh, that service might be provided by um, a traditional transit operator or by a TNC. Um, I think the opportunity is there to provide the first mile, last mile access because that's severely lacking in many places. The challenge is in how to do it safely. Where can you do it in a place where you can have some kind of segregation between those automated vehicles and the rest of the traffic? Um, uh, and, for example, in the UK, uh, there's a town called Milton Keynes where they're doing some experiments. They're used, they have some really wide bikeways, so they're using the bikeways for the automated vehicles. They're small automated vehicles, but they're providing some of that first mile, last mile access using the bikeways. So that's maybe a special circumstance, but we need to look for examples like that. Or I also think of retirement communities where you might have kind of a gated community and it's got limited traffic on the roads, but if it if you can put the vehicles out there where they can help improve accessibility, it, it also helps with the accessibility of seniors who may not be so good at driving anymore, or may not be so comfortable with driving anymore, but the automated vehicles could provide circulation service within the community. Um, yes? Yeah, how, um, how large of an impact, or how important do you think like, public perception is well, I think I think public perception is actually likely to be pretty volatile in this area. Right now, the public perception is um, this is going to be nirvana. This is going to solve all of our problems, and it's going to make life so much better. But it's based on a misperception about what the technology is really capable of doing. And the thing I'm worried about is the backlash. When people start becoming aware, oh, this isn't really everything I thought it was going to be. It's actually something much more limited. Are people going to say, oh, that's not even worth dealing with because it's so insignificant? Um, we also have a problem. The public perception has also cost some people their lives already because people thought systems were much more capable than they really were. Uh, you know, even if a system works 90% of the time, that's nothing because you still have to deal with the other 10% of the time when it doesn't work. It works 99% of the time, that's even more dangerous because people forget about the 1% of the time when it doesn't work. And Obviously, a Tesla driver in Florida thought he had a really capable system, and it turns out that system wasn't nearly as capable as he thought it was, and the manufacturer of that system didn't do a very good job of explaining the limitations of the system so that you have an informed user. So where I'm going with that is there's a really serious responsibility on the part of the developers of these systems to educate the customers about what the systems can do and especially what the systems cannot do. They have to really do a lot of work to make sure people understand the limitations so they don't get in trouble and they don't uh, try to use the system in situations in which it's really not capable because uh, that's when it gets very dangerous. Okay, last question. Oops, yeah. Everyone put their hands together, right? Hands up. <laughs> So yeah. I'm back beyond that, you talked about the perverse incentives earlier about getting this information. What are going to be the incentives for manufacturers to take responsibility, to take this responsibility if their incentives that they sell more cars? Okay. Yeah, so what would the incentives be for the manufacturers to behave responsibly? Well, I'd say that the first incentive is the liability system. So, uh, I mean, that's in a way what our tort liability system does, it holds their feet to the fire if they do something irresponsible. Uh, 
A second possibility would be government regulations, and that could be regulations at either the federal level or the state level that set certain minimum thresholds. And that's what NHTSA started doing with the document they released a couple of months ago, uh, try to lay out the, um, the framework of the types of things that the manufacturers need to be doing in order to make these systems safe. Now we'll see how this goes through the public process in terms of whether there's a lot of pushback from the industry or whether there's general support. I, I've heard a mix of different kind of responses, but um, it will probably involve some mixture of government regulations and then the liability system as the backup. That if they do something irresponsible, uh, they're going to wind up paying when somebody gets killed or injured. Um, and that's kind of a crude way of handling it. Um, but that seems to be the way it is most likely to work. Okay, let's thank Dr. Cotto.